Welcome to ETF Market Insights, a weekly show focusing on the evolving world of ETF investing. Each Friday, a new panel of thought leaders aims to provide investment education and insights with the goal of helping you become an informed investor. Make sure to visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights to watch previous episodes. And remember to hit subscribe so you receive a notification when we post new content and when we go live each Friday. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. Welcome back to ETF Market Insights. I'm your host, Aaron Allen with BMO ETFs. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Vish, uh, who is a portfolio manager here at BMO ETFs with us. And we're going to dig into emerging markets. We're going to look at the uh, investment opportunity here, past performance, uh, some thoughts around our outlook, uh, and also some, some risks to consider and how you might weave this into your portfolio. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that we're not providing any advice or investment recommendations today. Today is all about providing education around the markets, around using ETFs for Canadian do-it-yourself investors. Another reminder to check out our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed already, hit subscribe and, and ring that bell so that you're notified. Also wanted to remind everybody of our website, etfmarketinsights.com. We've got a wealth of uh, tools and resources for you there to check out if you're looking to go deeper on any subject. Uh, so check that out as well. All right, Vish, welcome to uh, Market Insights. Um, Vish, as I mentioned, portfolio manager with BMO ETFs. Uh, he focuses on a range of our equity ETFs, but one of his uh, specialties is emerging markets. Um, you have over two decades of experience in the investment industry, and you've been with us here at BMO ETFs for about seven years. So really happy to have you on today, Vish. Thank you. I'm going to get started just with a quick one-minute update. Uh, I want to acknowledge all of the turmoil with the U.S. bank situation that we're still going through right now. Uh, we've got a lot of questions from the audience over the past week. Um, you know, and I just wanted to share this chart really. Investors uh, who are looking to keep their financial exposure might just be wondering where to go and what are some other options if you are looking to, to move away from US banks. So we've included a chart here from National Bank and it's just showing all the Canadian listed financial ETFs that have the least amount of regional bank exposure and it's sorted by AUM. So I thought this was a really handy uh, visual if you're looking for alternatives in this space. You can see here our ZEB and ZWB right at the top. So ZEB is our equal weight banks ETF. It holds those six big Canadian banks in an equal weight. And ZWB uh, does the same with a covered call overlay, uh, thereby improving its yield. Uh, so two Canadian options for you if you are rethinking that US bank exposure. We're gonna get into some of the more specific questions with FISH at the end of today's call that we've received. Um, from our viewers, but I also just wanted to highlight like here come ETFs again sort of to save the day when it comes to liquidity and price discovery. In every crisis, uh, we seem to see ETFs just shining through. So uh, just a reminder on, on how helpful they are in the investing world. All right, Vish, let's get into EM and emerging markets. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about sort of how emerging markets are classified and, and what's the definition of an emerging market, if you would get us started. Sure. So if we think of the overall investable opportunity set in equities, uh, you know, one way of classifying it is uh, MSCI's ACQUI definition, the all country world index so that encompasses both developed and emerging markets. And so developed markets, I think most folks are familiar with those, uh, you know, Canada, the US, the EFI markets, Europe, Australasia, and the Far East, uh, as well as some markets, uh, uh, you know, like uh, throughout Europe and so on. And so that's the developed markets. And uh, it's entirely possible to invest uh, exclusively through developed markets to get international and uh, domestic or North American exposure. But uh, beyond the so called developed markets, as represented by the MSCI World Index, are the emerging markets. And that's a basket of over 23 different countries uh, that MSCI, for example, and other index providers for that matter, classify as economies that are transitioning from developing to developed status. So they, they have significant potential for economic growth, but they're also characterized by some differences versus developed markets, perhaps slightly less developed financial markets, uh, you know, institutions, maybe uh, some less 
you know, in, investment in infrastructure and lower levels of income per capita. Uh, and so uh, along with that comes uh, additional risks uh, in those emerging markets uh, due to factors like political instability sometimes, uh, currency fluctuations, and oftentimes less developed legal systems. So, you know, given all of these heightened risks, then one might wonder why bother with emerging markets at all. And as I mentioned, it's entirely possible to invest just in the developed markets and still have substantial international exposure. But of course, the main reason that you know uh, EM is something that investors should consider having some exposure to is that uh, if you look at the developed markets and invest exclusively via developed markets, their uh, rates of economic growth are significantly slower uh, compared to emerging markets. And so you know, associated with investing in emerging markets is the opportunity uh, to benefit from these underlying countries to catch up with developed markets, as it were, and benefit from the favorable demographic megatrends, the move towards uh, rapid urbanization, uh, the technological advancements as they build the infrastructure that we all take for granted uh, in the so-called first world. And so for growth-oriented investors, it's definitely worth taking a look at, of course, you know, within one's risk appetite, taking into account the different risks that uh, exist in the various emerging markets. Perfect. Thanks for that. And then, of course, different index providers will classify countries differently, right? There's like FTSE has a very popular EM index as well. They may include or yeah. not include. They'll, they'll there are different uh, standards, uh, uh, you know, based on criteria like market access, for example. So the example you mentioned, uh, FTSE versus MSCI, you know, one notable difference between those two uh, providers of indexes and their definition of emerging markets is with respect to Korea. So, you know, uh, certainly Korea is an advanced economy in many respects, but uh, FTSE considers uh, Korea a developed market, whereas MSCI considers Korea an emerging market. And that primarily has to do with market access, uh, the inability for investors to directly convert currency themselves. So it's a restricted uh, currency, the Korean won. So, uh, you know, the oh, particular uh, investment yeah. solutions that we offer use the MSCI definition, uh, which does not include Korea as a developed market, that it includes it as an emerging market. Good. So, yeah, it's something to consider always looking under the hood when it comes to ETFs and indexes to make sure uh, you're investing in the countries you want to be invested in. All right, let's look at uh, performance of this asset class. Uh, we've got a chart here showing relative to developed markets, but Definitely, it's faced some headwinds over the past few years. Maybe you can speak to uh, the perform past performance on EM here. Sure, sure. Uh, so this particular uh, graph goes back to 2018 or so. So if you look at uh, you know emerging markets as a group, uh, which is depicted by the uh, green line, oh, that's for China. And uh, I guess let me just zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, the blue line uh, is emerging markets and, and the green line is, is China. You can see that they've strongly underperformed over this time frame relative to developed market equities like U.S. and EFI equities, for example. And there's numerous reasons as to why you know, this is the case uh, as well. At the same time, you know, we believe that there's a few reasons why emerging market performance as a broad class may be positioned to outperform uh, you know, into, the, into the near future. And so any discussion of emerging markets is not complete without considering China, given that it represents, uh, you know, for the MSCI definition, over 30% of the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. So, you know, what happens in China is going to be a large determinant of performance for emerging markets as a whole. And uh, certainly if we want to look at, you know, why uh, EM has underperformed over this horizon, like when you go all the way back to 2018, for example, you have to think about what's happened uh, in China specifically then, given that it's over 30% of the benchmark. And over the past few years, China and the US have been involved in you know, a trade war that has risen and fallen in importance at various times. And it's encompassed battles over technology, financial disclosures of Chinese stocks trading in the US and, you know, and, and other elements. So that's been a factor in the underperformance of Chinese equities in the past few years. And of course, uh, the certain matter of the pandemic which affected everyone, but it impacted the Chinese economy particularly hard due to their zero COVID policy, which essentially shut down, you know, the entire economy more or less for years. And, and you can see that reflected in stock returns in the green line, which is for China uh, from mid-year 2021 onwards, it plummets like straight down, right? Uh, and then, you know, another factor that's affected EM performance is US dollar strength from the interest rate hiking campaigns that we've witnessed you know uh, lately and that 
affected risk appetite heavily. Uh, you know, EM market flows are heavily impacted by risk appetite, with increased risk appetite leading to more flows into emerging markets and vice versa. The, what we've seen, reduced risk appetite from tighter monetary conditions, perhaps tailing back on risk appetite and affecting EM. It also makes it more expensive, a uh, strong US dollar does it, it to uh, you know, service US dollar denominated debt for the various EM countries that have such uh, you know, debt. And then beyond just China, if we look at you know, the global sell-off in, in technology companies in, in the past year or so, that certainly did not help emerging markets either. Uh, and, you know, uh, and the reason for that is they've evolved. You know, today's emerging markets don't look exactly like, quote unquote, yesterday's emerging markets. They're much less dependent uh, or reliant on the commodity um, complex, let's say, uh, to drive returns. They've shifted the makeup of their economies largely, uh, you know, more and more rather towards information technology and high technology. So, you know, that's certainly a bigger influence on returns. Uh, and if we look specifically now to a turning point, what we believe is a turning point around October of 2022, uh, if you look at the green line, for example, right at the very, very bottom, uh, focusing on that green line, you can see a sharp turnaround in the direction of returns. And that coincides more or less with the end of China pursuing its zero COVID policy, which, you know, once they essentially made that decision, that was more or less an open for business sign is our, our, our view. And, and since then, we've seen activity and performance uh, in China or any index that embeds China dramatically pick up and we can see that in the numbers on the on the table if you look at the returns for the three month period I think that captures it nicely this goes to the end of January and three months uh, would mean the end of October uh, 2022 so if you see the returns for that three month period we can see that the MSCI China ESG leaders index ETF ticker ZCH is up approximately 57 percent from the end of October to the end of January and then the Broad Emerging Markets Fund, the BMO MSCI Emerging Markets Index ETF, ticker ZEM, it's up 19% from October, contrasting against the S&P 500 return over the same period of just over 3%. So certainly it appears that the market uh, believes that the environment for mar emerging markets has materially changed. And you know, uh, beyond uh, uh, the China reopening, let's look at some other factors that underlie the positive price action that we've we've seen and uh, and that maybe suggests that there's you know more to come. Yeah, for sure. I think with, with China and just the sheer amount of savings they have in that economy right now, it's just, we've already seen it turn around, but I think there's definitely more to come there. I think North America, we were locked right down for not even close to that amount of time and we had record savings. China is just incredible in terms of the amount they have sitting on the sidelines. All right, let's look at uh, uh, valuations. Uh, what are your thoughts around sure. valuations again? Well, uh, you know, for context now, keep in mind, if we're talking about valuations, it's completely typical for emerging markets to trade at a discount versus, you know, developed markets. And, you know, that's consistent with the risk assessment that's been made by the market in aggregate for years. It, it's reflective of the higher risks associated with emerging markets. So it's normal for them to trade at a, a discount. So then I guess it becomes a question of looking at how much of a discount relative to history. And, and uh, so what we can see, if we look at two widely used measures of stock valuation, both uh, the key takeaway is that emerging markets are trading at multi-decade discounts to their historical uh, discounts. So there's good. So you know they're usually on sale relative to developed markets, but not this much on sale. This is like a, a fire sale. So there's good reason to believe that these discounts uh, will narrow to move closer to the norm. You know, in the coming months and years, and we've already seen since October some moves towards that discount narrowing. So on the left uh, is uh, a graph uh, which is the price to book ratio, that is, uh, you can think of it as the you know, how much you have to pay for each $1 of book value, expressed as a ratio. And emerging markets are currently trading with a relative price to book value ratio that's near a multi-decade low against the MSCI world, around a 28% discount, versus where it would typically be, roughly a 10 to 12% uh, discount. So if there continues to be a compression of the discount towards the historical norms, then that sh this should bode really well for you know, EM returns. Uh, and on, on the right-hand side, uh, we show the price to forward earnings ratio for the MSCI world and the MSCI emerging markets index. And we can see that the emerging markets index is now uh, trading at a discount. The discount is depicted by the gray sort of, um, you know, blob, shadow. I guess let's yep. call it, yeah, shadow. Um, and it's trading at a discount of about 43% now relative to the MSCI world index. 
And by any account, that represents a multi-decade wide uh, discount. And you know, given the recent China reopening, among other, among other factors uh, that I could cite, you know, that suggests that there's a lot of room for prices to return, uh, to, to run rather, you know, as that discount moves a little bit closer towards the historical norms. So those are two widely used measures of valuation. And then, you know, if you look uh, beyond that, uh, other, you know, indications of, of value uh, one could look at would be things like the dividend yield, uh, for example. Um, so I think we have something on that. Uh, here we are. Right. So, you know, dividend yield as well, too, as well at multi-decade lows. Normally, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's typical for emerging markets yields to be at a slight premium towards the uh, versus the MSCI world's dividend yields. But right now, uh, they are trading uh, essentially at 1.6 times the normal dividend yield. So that is like way out of line with their history uh, and, you know, suggests uh, that uh, in, in this measure anyway, that uh, things are abnormal. And again, coupled with the, the recent changes, uh, as well as something very important to note, which is, um, you know, the, the forecasted earnings increases in the underlying companies in the emerging markets uh, index, those are on the rise as well, in contrast to developed market equities in, in general, where you don't see the same rate of earnings growth uh, forecasts. So that is a, you know, a very key point. So it's like not enough for it to just be trading at a discount, maybe it trades at a discount for a reason, but when it's coupled with a, a, a catalyst uh, for that to change, then that's what one, you know, uh, should be concerned about and consider as a, maybe a reason to to look at emerging markets again. Yeah, oftentimes when North American markets are sort of slipping into recessionary territory, people are looking to EM to provide that lower correlation uh, asset so, for sure. Yeah. So okay, let's dive into some of the countries more specifically, if we can. Vish, uh, we talked a lot about China coming out of the lockdown and the opportunity that's going to entail but what's happening in some of these other countries that might present a good investment opportunity yeah, as a whole uh, you know emerging markets uh, projected growth rate uh, as estimated by numerous organizations uh, including the world bank which these numbers are from uh, gdp growth rates uh, looking at 2021 22 23 and then there are longer term forecasts as well which illustrate essentially the same story which is that the em countries as a group have much you know higher projected uh, growth, uh, you know, into the future, even with it uh, tailing, you know, off a little bit from 2021 to 2022, it's set to, you know, reaccelerate. So one of the countries, for example, is India. Uh, you know, India has a number of, uh, and India has certainly been on a tear returns wise over the last few years, kind of an anomaly amongst a lot of the other uh, countries in the world, developed or emerging for that matter. Uh, you know, uh, but over the long run, it's expected to become perhaps the third biggest, uh, you know, equity market uh, eventually, you know, uh, in the world in the next uh, decade or two. And that's uh, as forecast uh, by S&P. Uh, they've got a, you know, a massive uh, middle class and massive demographic tailwinds that are going to boost the fortunes of India. Right now, the valuations are a little bit, you know, close to fair to, to slightly rich, but over the mid to long run, uh, the story behind uh, continued growth uh, in India is a very, very, uh, you know, robust uh, story as well. India has been benefiting from some other trends too, and benefiting a little bit from uh, the, the, you know, the U.S.-China trade war, for example. As many companies are seeking to broaden their trade alliances to be not as dependent on China as the factory of the world, and have diversified away or are attempting to diversify away, and in many cases they're looking to India, uh, you know, and so that's another a tailwind that should help uh, India within, uh, you know, uh, on a dedicated, you know, standalone basis or within uh, an emerging markets type strategy. If you look at China, uh, uh, of course, you know, we saw as expected, uh, given the shutdown, we saw the GDP, you know, growth rate, you know, slow uh, down dramatically, but, you know, for the reasons I already mentioned, it's, it's uh, you know, set to uh, accelerate again. And then just in general, a number of EM countries in terms of interest rate hikes were sort of ahead of the curve relative to, Developed markets, and so in in many or mo, you know in many cases they they reached the end of their hiking cycle and are set to you know hit hit, hit you know hit the gas pedal again if not you know now uh, probably sooner than you know we're ready to do so. 
So that's another, uh, you know, uh, beneficial, like another tailwind that should boost the fortunes uh, of the countries in EM. Okay, great. So lots of uh, good opportunities, it sounds like. Uh, but of course, emerging markets don't come with a volatility. Um, so let's discuss um, some of the risk factors associated with the, these markets. Can you walk us through, you know, what are the big risks and how investors might try to mitigate these? When investing in EM? Sure. Well, I mean, there are a number of key risks. Some of the some of the big ones are just cited right there on the on the page. Uh, you know, currency risk, of course. So you know, currency volatility um, is a is a uh, factor that can you know greatly affect the realized returns for a Canadian dollar uh, investor. Uh, and you know, you've got countries like Russia, for example, which are you know in the emerging markets were in the emerging markets index until you know, the uh, Ukraine uh, war, you know, uh, that's a perfect example of like a political risk to the max uh, and that impacted, uh, you know, everything, all three buckets, liquidity risk, political risk, currency risk. Um, so just in general, investing in emerging markets, given the diversity of the markets within, they, they carry a higher level of risk, uh, you know, due to some of those factors. They're generally less liquid than U.S. equities. What isn't, right? Uh, you know, U.S. equities is the most uh, liquid asset class uh, in the world in terms of equities. Um, and you know, often they have more mm, frictional uh, risks involved in order to access the market, different market uh, conventions and restrictions on converting currencies back and forth, different levels of accessibility, restrictions on foreigners holding you know, more than certain amounts of shares, so foreign ownership restrictions and whatnot. So these are all considerations that we take into account when we manage our emerging markets exposures in the different funds. Uh, that we run. Uh, we, we monitor, you know, all of these key risks and evaluate, you know, how pertinent they are uh, to providing the exposures we would like to provide to unit holders. Uh, of course, the ultimate risk mitigator uh, is, you know, what's perhaps known as the only free lunch in investing, which is diversification. Yeah. Uh, and so by investing across over 23 countries and, for example, with ZEM, the Emerging Markets Index ETF, you know, over 850 different stocks, that provides some you know, a natural uh, risk mitigation in that, you know, uh, not everything is going to be moving in the same uh, way. So, you know, those are the those are the kind of things we're looking at. We also consult and work closely with the, the index provider in order to monitor risk factors and consult on changes being proposed in order to help us uh, navigate the evolving global landscape and the different risks that are presented in the best way. Yeah, it was interesting to see when when the rush the war in Russia broke out, how fast index providers were to kicking Russia out. Like I can't remember how long it took, but not long at all, really. It did not take long at all. Everybody was on side. Yeah. All right, that's great. And then one of the factors that we see impacting markets right now is the price of oil and uh, energy. So how does this impact all the different emerging market uh, regions? Are are higher prices positive or are they a negative? Both. It depends on the country, right? I guess like this uh, illustrates, uh, you know, the range of uh, uh, experiences or the, you know, the benefactors and, and like the winners and the losers, let's say, uh, uh, in which economies are, you know, heavily linked to oil and which perhaps, uh, you know, aren't. So, I mean, they can have positive and negative effects, uh, you know, positive effects for the oil exporters, you know, uh, like Russia, of course, and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, um, and, you know, and Russia, of course, has benefited, uh, you know, from uh, oil, uh, you know, during the e Ukraine uh, war. And whereas countries like, you know, China and India, which are net oil importers, might be more at the mercy of, uh, you know, the oil price when it's high, uh, uh, you know, during, uh, in, in order to like, you know, secure their oil supplies. Now, again, they've also benefited in that they've continued to maintain relations with with uh, you know Russia in this respect, and are still able to transact. But in general, you know importers like India and China would suffer with higher you know uh, oil prices, and uh, and you know you have your uh, exporters like Saudi and whatnot, which you do get exposure to in emerging uh, markets. Uh, you know by our ZEM uh, fund, they are clear beneficiaries, obviously, of of oil. So it, as well, you know, it can in fact impact the currency. Uh, of the various countries involved. They can come under pressure when oil prices rise as countries that are really reliant on oil imports. They might need to sell their currencies in order to buy oil and that can lead to increased inflation and, and currency depreciation among other factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. 
And then we talked about risk mitigation in uh, emerging markets. I think taking an ESG approach to EM is a good way to tackle some of the risks associated, but walk us through, um, we have two ESG EM exposures, China and India at BMO ETFs, but walk us through why ESG makes sense in the EM world. Well, I think uh, ESG or you know, taking environmental, social and governance considerations you know, into account as part of the investment process as, uh, as our strategies, uh, our ESG strategies do explicitly by by looking at and considering you know in every sector uh which companies you know score the highest on these measures for you know uh sustainable practices good governance practices uh and good environmental practices um is particularly uh beneficial in the emerging markets because of the fact uh that you know in many cases these markets can be less transparent uh, with regard to governance and may not share the same, uh, let's say, governance practices that we are more accustomed to in Western style markets. And so therefore, systematically applying uh, screens in order to try to uncover the best of breed, as it were, uh, you know, within a, a given market on these measures could be, you know, one way to try to screen out perhaps the worst offenders, let's call it, you know, from the investing universe. And it's not a guarantee necessarily of superior performance, but it's a way to at least take these considerations into an account into account in an explicit way and consciously and with eyes wide open. And it can lead to, you know, positive outcomes, you know, certainly on a social basis or an environmental basis and, you know, can benefit those investors who would like to, you know, invest according to or align their investments with their, with their value, you know, system uh, or value, you know, uh, set. Um, but just in general, from a pure investment perspective, uh, you know, systematically applying ESG uh, criteria to the strategy uh, can hopefully, you know, result in portfolios that should be better equipped to, uh, you know, manage the different ESG risks and, you know, drive positive social, environmental and, and governance outcomes. So I, I think uh, it's particularly important for China and India. You know, China is renowned uh, for being, you know, semi-opaque. In many regards, right? And so, um, and there are you know thousands upon thousands of uh, 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 you know investment options in China. And to a Western investor, they may not all be you know uh, household names and transparent. So having a systematic you know uh, method in place in order to screen the names that we have uh, available to us to invest in uh, can be a very beneficial approach. Okay, good. And then what we're showing here is just a look at closer look at China and India. So these are index returns and index risk metrics for the indexes right. that our ETFs track. Yeah. So you right. can see yeah, the outperformance over the very long term of the ESG mandate, but you also see the improvements to uh, risk associated with as measured by beta here. And, um, you know, specifically in India, that standard deviation improvement as well, too. So the right. Over the long run, you know, we expect that these should uh, be able to deliver, you know, more or less benchmark like returns, but with perhaps a, a little less um, individual company risk through this method, you know, the, through this type of methodology, uh, but it should deliver, you know, broadly similar performance experience to the parent universe but with fewer ESG type risks associated with it, which are ever more important uh, in today's environment. Absolutely. All right, let's walk through how this can actually fit in a portfolio. Are we making this 50% of a portfolio now because the outlook looks so good? Or what would you suggest here in terms of portfolio construction? I investment? would not recommend 50%, uh, you know, uh, but uh, you know, it is a, it can be a wild ride in emerging markets because you know, there's such a diverse group of countries, you know, with like radically different um, economies baked into the broad emerging markets, uh, you know, index. However, uh, the overall numbers and the demographic trends and the uh, earnings growth acceleration and the prospects for rapid urbanization, all these other mega tailwinds, these, the, these are forces that are set to be in play for, you know, decades to come. So I think you want to be there. But you have to just tailor the weight to uh, you know your risk tolerance, and uh, you know determine what that is depending on you know uh, where you are and whatnot. You know using your normal methods of determining your risk appetite. But for example, um, you know I think one reason to include it beyond just the growth opportunity is also 
the correlation benefits or the diversification benefits that one gets by incorporating assets that don't move the same way as all your other assets, right? So, you know, we see how in times of crisis, uh, assets tend to, you know, seem to move very, very similarly. Everything's going down, everything's going up. But, uh, you know, as much as that is true in many uh, cases, it's less true uh, for emerging markets. So if you look at the correlations of weekly returns uh, going back, you know, well over a decade, for example, but this holds true, you know, even over much longer terms. Uh, so EM, the the, uh, the line highlighted in yellow, you can see the returns uh, are, you know, less correlated with all the other um, asset classes. So, you know, the practical implication, uh, you know, uh, of that, it means that, uh, you know, when markets are plummeting, you know, maybe emerging markets are not plummeting as much and vice versa when they're moving in one direction, they may not. So, you know, it, it can offer a different return path. Uh, and when incorporated into an overall portfolio and one calculates what the risk adjusted returns are uh, and characteristics are, it can make the overall portfolio uh, look uh, and perform you know, in a less volatile way just by including a diversifying asset. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for that. Now, I want to spend the last uh, few minutes here just high level showcasing the different EM or emerging markets ETFs we have with BMO. So, uh, Vish, if you could walk us through these, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, I won't go through all the details here. This is just to highlight the breadth of um, options we have in order to access emerging markets. So our our broad market, our headline, like uh, emerging markets ETF is ZEM, uh, it's the biggest emerging markets uh, ETF in uh, Canada, and it tracks the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, which provides exposure to over 23 different emerging uh, markets. China, India, you know, uh, Taiwan, Brazil, you know, uh, Middle East, uh, you know, and, and Africa uh, as well. And so you can see the exposure is very diverse and it covers, you know, significant exposure across all sectors. And one thing, as I had mentioned previously, uh, is how significant the information technology weight has become in the emerging markets index now. It's like the second biggest uh, sector for emerging markets. And if you took a look at this, uh, you know, even just a decade ago, uh energy and materials would have been much higher uh than they are now and so you know uh the nature of emerging markets has uh, has shifted so you get exposure to you know a lot of household names uh uh within this type of structure uh you know alibaba samsung uh taiwan semiconductor indian various indian equities and and whatnot so it's a it's a very good grab bag of uh you know high growth opportunities yeah, that's what jumped out at me was the uh, sector allocation and how different it is from Canada specifically. We're all home bias Canadian portfolios around here. I'm not going to lie. Um, and just the difference with the overweight to financials, even consumer discretionaries, it's almost like turned on its head in terms of the exposures there. Right. What and about the, India? Yeah, the next one, uh, ZID, the BMO MSCI India ESG Leaders Index. Yeah, you know, uh, some time ago, we changed the mandate uh, of this fund to be ESG uh, focused, uh, recognizing that, uh, you know, this would be one of the countries where, you know, that screening methodology would be beneficial to unit holders and, uh, you know, allow us to get the best of breed Indian companies on these on these measures. And so this uh, holds direct Indian exposure, you know, to local Indian equities, uh, all the all the top uh, names in India you can get here in, in one ticket. So. You know, uh, again, you can see how significant the IT weight is here, uh, which is consistent with that burgeoning sector and in India and financials and energy also have substantial weights. Uh, consumer staples is a, you know, consumer staples, and consumer discretionary, two sectors here, which should kind of benefit from the massively growing um, middle class in US, uh, sorry, in, in, in India rather. Uh, so yeah, that's a dedicated India strategy. And then the next one is the China ESG leaders uh, index ETF. Once again, uh, we switched the mandate of this this fund as well some time ago to invest directly in China rather than through uh, ADRs. And this gives us a much broader opportunity set to get access to, you know, many, many more companies than would be available if you're investing exclusively via, you know, ADRs. So that's definitely, uh, you know, beneficial for investors seeking exposure to to the China growth opportunity. So, you know, we have, you know, uh, many, many holdings there. I think, you know, well over a uh, hundred names in there providing direct exposure to China. And again, uh, 
very diverse uh, you know sector mix again so it's available and then I guess you know uh, I, I should also mention as part of our low volatility equity ETF suite we offer a low volatility emerging markets equity ETF ZLE and so the premise of this fund is a little bit different whereas the previously mentioned ETFs particularly ZEM are largely you know market cap weighted so the weights of the companies are determined basically by the, the size of the companies more or less the public the publicly available you know share float the the portfolio for ZLE and all of our low volatility equity strategies for that matter it's constructed in a different way uh, in that uh, we we weight most heavily you know uh, those companies that have you know lower betas uh, so less sensitivity to the market and the premise behind that is that historically uh, you know across markets there's something called the low volatility uh, anomaly which is seen that companies that are in fact less volatile tend to outperform contrary to what uh, the old mantra is you got to take a risk if you want reward the reality uh, as borne out in results across markets uh, and uh, environments is that in fact uh, it's not always the case you can sometimes take less risk and so this provides exposure to the emerging markets but in a lower uh, risk uh, way than the than the volatility which is embedded in the normal uh, emerging markets fund it's a different type of an approach uh, and it won't be ideal for an investor seeking to track the MSCI index but it but it does provide a very good experience in emerging markets in a in a less volatile way Absolutely. All right. Thanks for those intros, Vish. I do want to turn to our audience questions, as I promised, uh, two questions on financials for you today, Vish. So what changes have been made to ZWK and your U.S. banks, ETF, ZUV, uh, or ZBK, following the uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapse? Right. Yeah. Well, of course, we all have been watching with great uh interest and alarm uh the you know the turmoil south of the border in the u.s regional banks space uh you know starting with the silicon valley bank and uh, you know a number of other banks like signature bank and and so on that have um you know suffered amidst uh you know a bank run and uh you know a liquidity uh run and so you know we've been watching it very closely and it still happens that you know these uh etfs the wk and our u.s banks etfs they they all you know, broadly use as the selection universe or the basis for our investment an, an index. Uh, uh, our, first, let's start with the US banks ETFs, which are equal weighted. They use as their basis an equally weighted bank index, which is reconstituted periodically. And it so happened that right around the time of this turmoil, these indexes were due to be reconstituted. In fact, they were due to be um, re-evaluated on March the 10th, which coincided perfectly or imperfectly, depending on your perspective, with uh, this turmoil in the in the U.S. And you know, recognizing that the weights uh, behind those ETFs would be reestablished based on pricing, you know, from the 10th of March, and then rebalanced in the in the money in the real money ETFs that are tracking them on the 17th. Um, you know, numerous market participants and the index provider, you know, were uh, consulted and selective. The index provider behind the equal weights. You, the, the U.S. Equal Weight Bank Index uh, concluded that given the turmoil and tremendous volatility in the U.S. regional banking space, that it was prudent to postpone the, the rebalancing of that index by one week with the idea being that perhaps more stability in prices uh, and more clarity regarding the situation would prevail. And that might provide a more sound environment in order to uh, you know, rebalance a, uh, an index and of course you know linked to that portfolio so that's what happened in this case is what they did was rather than uh, taking a snapshot of the u.s bank space on the 10th of march they instead uh, took a snapshot uh, just this past wednesday uh, and will implement the changes in their index as we and as we will implement the changes in you know the various products that incorporate that uh this friday so uh, we believed uh, that uh, that was a you know a good decision uh, that they made given the historic volatility uh, and market action witnessed in, the, in that space. And so around that, uh, you know, we made some tweaks to the the portfolios from a risk management uh, perspective in view of price action that we were seeing. But but essentially, uh, we will rebalance these portfolios in line with the the index this Friday. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. 
And then the second question was, should I be concerned about Canadian banks following the issues in the US? What makes them different? Well, I would say, you know, no is the short answer. I, I don't think that uh, we should be concerned about Canadian banks having the same types of issues that we saw in the US. You know, no bank in Canada has failed in, I think, I understand like more than two and a half decades here. And while the possibility of bank failure in, is not zero in Canada, it never is zero, many of the variables that, you know, contributed to the Silicon Valley bank demise, they don't really apply in the Canadian banking sector. We don't really have this kind of problem in Canada. Uh, to be honest, uh, you know, our banks are, that are regulated and they have to meet very rigorous liquidity standards, which are set by federal regulators. Um, you know, our banking sector, in contrast to the US, it consists solely of like large money centers with very diverse clientele and revenue streams that kind of shield them from the deposit volatility, which in, in this case uh, threatened the US counterparts. You know, we don't have the same type of deposit volatility that we saw in, in these regional banks. Uh, in, in 2020, for example, starting starting then, we saw in those regional regional banks surging deposit growth, and then it was followed by synchronized withdrawal starting in 2022, uh, and then accelerating into this year, 2023. And that's some of the factors that you know that contributed to the demise of the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, is you know, with the huge influx of cash coming in, uh, uh, you know that needs to be invested. And then uh, similarly, when uh, it needs to be withdrawn, well. The, the banks need to liquidate the investments that are backing those assets uh, under some duress in order to meet the uh, client demands for liquidity. So you know, I think that was a failure of risk management, but Canadian banks are renowned for excellence in risk management and very, very um, you know, uh, robust risk measures. And in fact, you see that reflected in the prices of Canadian banks, which is the ultimate vote of confidence uh, in that if you look at Canadian banks, you see them trading at a really, really hefty price to book premium. Just like I was talking about the discounts that EM trades at, sometimes reflective of the risks embedded in EM. Conversely, uh, you know, Canadian banks trade at a hefty price to book premium relative to their US and European peers. And that's for a reason. Uh, the reason is that our banks are very, you know, well capitalized with very robust capital ratios. And looking back to recent history, they've demonstrated the ability to weather crises that have, you know, threatened or damaged other markets. Uh, you know, we avoided an earnings collapse during 09 and 2010, and 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 that gave us, uh, uh, you know, a, in Canadian banks, that is, you know, median P price to book multiple more than double uh, the median U.S. and European peers. And today, even uh, the median Canadian banks trading at 1.42 times the price to book multiple, which is about 60% higher uh, than the median U.S. and European bank multiples. So. You know, are there no risks? No, it's not the case. You know, there are still risks that are, are understood, which is, you know, um, some some folks, some followers of, of the space were concerned about Canadian banks uh, and the high exposure that they had to the mortgage lending business, you know, for example. But in aggregate, uh, you know, the mortgage lending books now are 37% uh, mortgages in, in aggregate. And that's down from where it was back in 2010 when it was about over 55%. And it's on par with U.S. banks and aggregate. So I think some of the key risk factors that were perhaps more of a concern historically are less of a concern, uh, you know, uh, now. And then the last thing is that you know, look, our banking sector is kind of an oligopoly. You know, there's everything centered around the big six banks. Uh, and then you know, there are some smaller financial in institutions in Canada, like some credit unions and and whatnot. But the ecosystem is not nearly as deep in terms of number of institutions uh as the united states you know has they've got a very large number of small and medium-sized regional banks which are subject to perhaps you know less regulation uh and so you know we've seen the effects of some of that less you know some of that lower regulation perhaps uh with the recent activity in the markets for sure i was reading the u.s has something like seven thousand banks and we have under 30. Right. <laughs> 85 percent of your assets are in the big six so that that risk to those of those smaller banks would not have such a, a big impact for sure as it has in this in the us okay Absolutely. thanks Fish. that was great now um that caps off uh, another great week of etf market insights uh, i loved all of your uh, insights around emerging markets fish uh we will be back next week same place same time I'll be joined by Jennifer Lee from BMO Capital Markets. We will be talking financials again, I'm sure, as she'll be giving us her economic outlook. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming on, Vish, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. 
To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at etfmarketinsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.